here to introduce our guest today, Jane Bulware. I am so excited to have Jane on today. Jane, welcome. I have so many things to say to, about you before we uh, uh, go into Hi. the interview. So Jane is a dear friend of mine. I actually met her at a Rebel 11 uh, retreat many years ago. She's become a Rebel 11 board member. And I have to just tell you that I knew on that retreat that I loved Jane so much because I woke up early one morning. I'm an early bird and so is Jane. And she's out making snow angels in the snow at like 5.30 in the morning. I'm like, oh, I love her so much. No one was supposed <laughs> to be up. It told me so much about you, Jane, which I still to this day love and uh, really will always be a place in my heart. It's a mutual admiration. In the fields of rural Idaho or Iowa, Jane defied expectations to lead billion dollar businesses and rise as a top Microsoft exec. By 52, she launched three, not just two, but three major ventures, navigated the U.S.'s largest merger, and inspired a new generation of leaders. Jane is donating all of her proceeds from Worthy um, to the Boys and Girls Club um, Youth Scholarship Program. Jane, I love this book so much. Oh. And the reason why is that every one of the 50 stories is so relatable and so real, just as you are. I mean, I, I, every word I read was, I'm like, this is so Jane th through and through. So congratulations. Thank you, Joni. I, that means a lot because that, um, having the stories be relatable is what my intent was. I wanted to write down my stories in such a way that it didn't say Jane did this and this and this and look at what I achieved. But the, the title of the story is actually called Worthy and Unworthy with the uncrossed out because it's as much about undoing the uns as it is about what you achieve because you can't really achieve without undoing your uns. And so you're saying that they were relatable, that you enjoyed reading Absolutely. them and that they resonate is really warms my heart because um, there are a lot of books out there that talk about breaks to riches or how women become successful with these five easy steps or follow my program. And this isn't that. No, this it's not really that. And this is one line that really stood out to me. I've been called a bulldog, bitch, brilliant, and inspiring all in one day. But today we are going to focus on the truth, brilliant and inspiring. So let's go. <laughs> Thank you. Get started. And about the other word, sometimes um, when people, you know, that used to bring me to my knees, when people would call me that, it was so, I thought that was so hurtful. And I really took that to heart. And now I see it's a label that someone tries to apply to me. And I can choose what to do with the labels someone apply to me. Yes. I, whether I choose to wear them or not, or I choose to just recognize that that is something that is them, not me, that's okay. Yeah, it's but I do like the brilliant and inspiring. Yeah, well, yeah. That's, that's lesson number one for today. So tell us a, the, about this book. I mean, it goes through, you know, your really, your early beginnings, growing up poor in Iowa and in a one room or two room um, farmhouse. Well, the part that people really get caught up on is that there were uh seven of us in a one bathroom house yes seven in <laughs> one, one bedroom one bedroom house. Bedroom house. <laughs> yeah it was one bedroom until dad tore the roof off after there were four of us I and five of us so what was it like growing up I mean you talk about being pretty isolated in the middle of the cornfields and tell us tell us about that experience well, um, I was born and raised in rural Iowa, and we came from a family that had pretty modest needs. We didn't always have what, what we didn't have. We found, borrowed, or made, right? And more than that, at that time, um, our world was really small. We, you know, everyone in our community was very similar. We were very Catholic, and they had a lot of kids, and I didn't know about a world outside of my community. I didn't see the ocean until I was 25. I didn't see a town bigger than 20,000 people until I was 16, really. Um, and we didn't talk about politics or sports. We didn't really watch TV. And so my world was so small that people say, well, what did you dream of? 
you know, it was, it was literally about survival and struggle sometimes that you didn't spend a lot of time dreaming when there was so much to be done in the here and now. And it took someone that actually intervened on my behalf to ask me about my future before I really knew how to think about it and guided me along that path. So I, I, there were so many good things that came out of my childhood. I'm very grateful for the lessons that I learned, how to work hard, that there, that you don't value someone or judge someone by their college education or what car they drive or how much money they have. All those things really helped me in my career going forward. But it was a very, very small world that I lived in until I left. And one of the things that really stood out to me in the book was that moment where you got a college scholarship. Will you tell us about th th uh, that experience and just give us some nuggets from there and what that meant to you? Well, it wouldn't have happened except a, I call her a gnarly old nun, Sister Frances Xavier. She was like three <laughs> foot nothing, I swear to God. But she had lightning bolts coming out of her eyes and she was someone that spoke with such passion and such conviction that when she said something, even though she was tiny, you listened and you believed and you acted. And she pulled me aside from class one day and said, hey, what are you doing after you graduate? And I was like, I didn't have a good answer. I was kind of stumbling because I didn't know. I just knew that I didn't want to stay where I was, but I didn't know what was forward. She said, you should go to college and you should major in forestry, which is interesting because there's no forests in Iowa and I'd never seen one. But yeah, I'm going to major in forestry. And she took an action, right? And the action was, she said, and I'll help you. There's a scholarship I think you should apply for. And I did. And it was a $320 scholarship, which by today's standards, like petty change. But what it said was, not only Sister FX, but someone believed that I was college material. Yeah. And it opened a door for me that I ran through. I mean, I left for college before my folks knew I was gone because that wasn't something we did. We didn't go to college. It wasn't even discussed, really. Um, and it it opened it, it it opened the world for me. It made available a different world. Even though I went to college two lefts from my driveway, you go down the driveway, you turn left, you go to the stop sign, you turn left, and you drive till you get to the college. It was literally that far away. It was an entirely different world away. And That's and the message here is: no matter how big you are, you can have an influence on someone, and. Yes. There's a difference between saying something to someone and then actually acting on their behalf to get it. Absolutely. And we'll be talking about the importance of, of doing that and mentoring people and standing up for women and, you know, everyone and giving them a hand up and not a handout because that's- I'm going to hijack this and say, you did that for me because I joined the board of the Boys and Girls Club and I wasn't sure how I could make a difference because I don't have, I'm not a billionaire. And you listened and you said- I have someone you should talk to. And in talking to them and connecting them, they helped raise money. And it made me realize that everyone knows someone and can have an impact going forward. So you were a life changer for me. And because of you, I am now the board chair and am giving away the proceeds for this book to Boys and Girls Club. Without you, I might not have been doing that. Oh, saying. Well, that makes me feel really good today. It's true. Thank you so much. Okay, let's dive into what you learned in your career. And, you know, I think it's so important for all of us, you know, who have self-doubt in, you know, their career and, or just in our life in general, but how did you end up, you know, coming from these very humble roots, building resiliency and confidence on a day-to-day -day basis? I would say the resilience and the confidence started at a very early age for me. I mean, I started working in the fields at a very early age and started leading and, and, seeking help and doing things that I didn't think were possible or others thought I shouldn't be doing at a very early age. And so I learned through resiliency, I learned in doing difficult things I couldn't imagine that I began to imagine myself differently. I began to imagine about things I hadn't done yet, not things I couldn't do, not things that people said I couldn't, wouldn't or shouldn't do, just things that I hadn't figured out or hadn't done yet, which opened up a whole world for me. So when someone suggests that I take a job and others thought it was too crappy or too risky or too off the career path, I said yes. Or if there was something that I wanted or needed to do, the question was, was it a door that I needed to walk through or was it a wall that I needed to run through? But either way, that was going to happen. 
It was going to happen. Yeah, it just had to happen really yet. Stood, yeah, one thing that really stood out to me in the book again and again and again is the power of yes, whether you're ready oh. or not. And, and you have embraced the power of yes so much in your life. And it's open doors that open doors for you that you couldn't even even imagined as a little girl growing up. Oh, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. I, I, in my wildest imagination, couldn't dream my life today. And, and even when I go back to Carolina, when told, like when I told my mom, I was going to be the corporate vice president at, at Microsoft, which is kind of, was kind of a big deal. She was like, oh, you never, you never did listen, Jane. You could have worked at the post office. They give you a uniform. You like to walk. They have President's Day off. Because she didn't own a computer. She'd never owned a computer, didn't own a cell phone, did not have that perspective. And that's the part that I want to say is when people tell me what I can't do mm -hmm. or, or look at me and, and judge me, they see me from their perspective. They don't know who I am. They don't know where I've come from. They don't see the world as I see it. So when I, I hear them, I respect that, but it's not, it's their view of me. And they, I have often thought to myself, oh, you don't know yet that this is going to happen and that we're going to get from here to there. And that is, I think, what I would hope that women embrace. There's so much research, Joni, by Harvard and by McKin uh, the McKinsey Group, et cetera, that says that women in their professional life or in their life wait until they feel qualified before they pursue a job or a promotion or something else. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, men just run right past it because they just assume that they're ready. You know, they just yes, yes, yes. whether they are or not. Right. <laughs> yeah. And women wait. And I would beg women on this call to stop waiting until you're ready. You will grow into it and to give yes. yourself permission not to know, but still to do. Right. So I think this is really um, a good next question. So. So with your humble beginnings, with you saying yes so quickly to a lot of things in your life for those doors to open, did you ever experience imposter syndrome? I'm trying to remember a day that I didn't. Yeah. Um, we all do, don't we? We all experience imposter syndrome. Um, the last year that I worked at Microsoft, I counted like 27 people on my calendar that I was mentoring or sponsoring or meeting with for coffee. And regardless of whether they're the most senior woman or the most junior starting out person in the career, each one of them felt that they were going to be found out, that they were an imposter. Mm -hmm. And I would say that oftentimes I would do a couple of things, just hold up a mirror to reflect back to them how amazing they were and what they had achieved and have them see it, own it, realize it and also know that their intuition already often told them what to do they just look for validation and to to try to just be able to do that to themselves yeah. so so that's um so so that's that's one thing um i'm trying to remember what the other thing i was going to say was it's gone now well we oh i know right? i'm sorry <laughs> um forgive me these lapses happen the other thing I would say is I used to feel afraid of afraid, afraid to show that I was afraid. And I thought I was the only one that was afraid, which just kind of goes with imposter syndrome. And key message here, I no longer fear being afraid. I fear not being afraid. Because when I'm afraid in the workplace, when I'm afraid in, in my personal life, I'm usually not physically in danger. If I am, that's something else, but I'm uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable. I'm over my skis. I'm doing something new. I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm trying something that I've never tried before. And there's a good chance I'll fail. And I want anybody to know that I'm afraid. I just I got this figured out. No, being afraid means that you're growing and you're stretching and you're challenging yourself. And that's good. That's nothing to be ashamed of. That doesn't make you an imposter. That makes you someone that is seeking someone that is growing and learning and and all of those positive things and I don't know when and how we started to think of that in a negative way that because I didn't know how to do a job I was an imposter the fact that I don't know a job means that I'm learning and growing and I need other people to support me because I don't have all the answers 
and that's okay. And you talked a lot about um, <clears throat> in a specific section of the book about vulnerability. And once you showed up to your team as being vulnerable, what happened, Jane? Oh, it, everything changed. I came into my I came into one job in particular. I was the vice president on the Windows business. It was a big billion dollar business. And I literally had to look up how it works.com because I wasn't technical, but I did know how to build businesses. I did know how to rally people. I was a good marketer. I knew how I knew how to build businesses. I just don't know technology. So the rather than come in and try to bullshit my way through, can I say that? Rather than yeah, my way through it. I um I was really honest and said, I need you to carry me on this. I don't know the technology. I don't okay to ask for help. And I asked for help and they rallied around me. And I said, here's my promise. Here's what I'm good at. And I'll do it to the best of my ability. And I will find out what each one of you are great at. And I will work as hard as I can to make you better than you thought you could or would be. And I will take the arrows and I will take the hill and I will get you what you need. And I will recognize reward and celebrate with you when we are successful because we will be. And wow, it took off. And it was only after I stopped pretending to be a title because I had a title. Of course I have the answers. What a bunch of malarkey. Yeah, exactly. And I think the other thing that you talked about, which, um, you know, was a challenge for you is what you call FUD. And I wanted to spend just, sorry, you guys, I'm just getting over COVID. So I'm still dealing with this. So I apologize for my, <laughs> my, my voice right now. But Jane calls FUD fear, uncertainty, and despair. And I thought it would be really fun for her to read a little chapter, just not a chapter, but a paragraph from her book, Worthy, on do you want to go ahead and do that? Sure. Jane? The book is called Worthy, and it says uh, stories of overcoming. And a lot of the overcoming for me was about FUD. I, I call it FUD, fear, uncertainty, and despair. And the chapter or the paragraph that, that Joan is referring to is called, it's, is this, it's on page 162. Fear, uncertainty, and despair isn't about age, title, or gender. It's about being human. My seeds of fear, uncertainty, and despair germinated in childhood and secured a stronghold during adolescence, waiting in anticipation of puberty to bud and blossom into adulthood, where their poisonous flowers dispersed ever more seeds that flourished in the fertile soil of my insecurity. Even the most caring, nurturing gardener can't prevent FUD. It can be treated with chemicals or yanked up by the roots or chucked into the mental trash bin. My FUD needed to be acknowledged and accepted, diligently managed and pruned so it didn't strangle or keep me from moving forward. Frickin I thought that was the most amazing paragraph ever. Talk to me about it a little bit more. Talk to us about it. Um, I think everybody's got FUD. Maybe. I still have FUD. I'm 60 years old and I still struggle with FUD to be sure. Um, fear, uncertainty, and despair. But the thing about that is it it is a reality. But it and and it can limit you or it can fuel you. The FUD can help you make connections with people that are authentic and real because we all have them, or they can isolate, hold you back, and provide that critical voice that keeps you stuck. And so I think, you know, recognizing your FUD and acknowledging your FUD and being real to others um, on your team and your life and your your relationships is what makes us human. And it's that that thing and that thing that um, doesn't need so much to be overcome as it needs to be embraced and managed. It's kind of like fear. I said, being afraid. I used to be afraid to be afraid and acknowledge it. And now I recognize that it is both my friend and it is an indicator for me that I need to listen to. Mm -hmm. The book again is called, un, it's called Worthy. I call it Worthy because nobody will buy it if it's called Unworthy or they'll think it's Christian and it's not. So much of my life has been spent undoing my uns, feeling unworthy, unable, unsure, unconfident, unpowerful. 
that I can be enabled, en encouraged, empowered, but it won't matter if I'm unning myself. So FUD is a reality, but I can't let it get in my way. I have to undo my own un. So I am able, I am powerful, I am courageous, I am sure. And when FUD rears its head, I need to listen to it and say, what of this do I need to take away? But sometimes I just have to tell FUD to bugger off. Take a hike. <laughs> yeah. and, and how powerful has that been when you've done that? Looked FUD in the face and said, you need to leave now. I, I sometimes have conversations, conversations with FUD now. I didn't use to. <laughs> I have conversations with FUD because it's like a FUD. It's my FUD. And I'm like, FUD, like we can do this. I can do this. You need to, you need to soften back. I hear you, but you need to soften back. It's also why I have girlfriends and I have family because they sometimes need to hold that mirror up for myself when I'm unable to do that. Sometimes my FUD gets a, too far out in front of me and then I just need to be able to find others that can that can pull it back for me. That's but I great. manage my FUD pretty carefully now through my gratitude journals and the, the way I take care of my self-care. So that so, yeah, and we're going to be talking about uh, rituals um, as well because I think that's really important for everyone to in their career in their personal life to have rich self care rituals that mm -hmm. that keep us grounded and real mm -hmm. and we'll be talking more about that in a few minutes. Um, so Jane, I know you don't really like this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I think. It's really important, like you've you've managed billions of dollars in projects, you've closed amazing um, deals, and you've had an amazing family life and home life. What do you think is one of the biggest lessons you've learned so far in your life? I know, I, I knew I was- How do you boil the ocean? ocean. <laughs> um... <laughs> What, um, I, it's taken me a while to learn to embrace. I really think as individuals, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses and looking for claiming, owning, acknowledging, championing what we're good at is really important. And I think sometimes as women, we tend to dismiss or give away those things that are our strengths. But, and, and in, in acknowledging what we're good at, it's not, it's not what that we're, we're it, it's, it's healthy. Because only when we acknowledge what we're good at, do we know to give it away? And do we know what we're not good at and surround ourselves with the people that have the strengths that we aren't? Because we know and are solid and are confident in what we're good at. So when we see them in others, we can acknowledge it and celebrate it and lift it up and say, wow, that's amazing. I can't do that. People that don't know who and what they are and what they're good at can't acknowledge someone else because they feel insecure. And so they hold them down instead of lift them up. And that is a huge lesson for me to be able to say, I'm good at this and acknowledge it and do, to own it and to feel good about that so that I in turn can lift those other people up. And that's how you build businesses. That's how you build families. That's how you build success in a way that you don't feel threatened by someone else. I and the other good. thing is, if you don't know what and who and what you're good at, then creating boundaries that protect that is virtually impossible. And if you can't create boundaries, I don't know how you have good relationships. One of the things I loved about your book, Jane, is how many examples um, that you gave about bringing people along and surrounding yourself with people who could could help you do anything that you dreamed of. And that really even started with, a, you know, a story out in the cornfields, right, okay. of, of building the team. And how important is the team to you in business and in life? It's everything for everything. me. Um, see prior comments. I know my strengths. I am, 
I am not the smartest, the fastest, the the most technical. I'm not any of those things, but I've become really adept at seeing that in other people. Sometimes when they can't themselves, and bringing that it's one, forward, bringing that out. It's one of your superhero powers. <laughs> I. I think I've spent so much time struggling so hard in my life and that I look for that in other people. I look for their strengths and I like to lift them up. And if it weren't for that, I would be nowhere because no one can do it by themselves. And I, there's people are like, Oh, I, I, what's your secret sauce? I want your secret sauce. There's no secret sauce. I, I don't do anything except to, Full stop. There's nothing about me that's unique or different, smarter, better, different, et cetera. It just isn't. The success I've had in my career and others is by is by really pulling together the strengths of others and acknowledging it. Um, and that's been really, really helpful. Um, when I was, you, the, the story that you're referring to from when I was in a cornfield, I think is really relevant because I used to do tassel corn. When I was a little kid, mm -hmm. our family didn't have much money and we had to work in the fields. And by the time I got to be, and that was, I was really, really young. And by the time I got mm -hmm. to be 15 or 16, I could hire my own crew. And detasseling corn is ungodly difficult work. You're in the sun. It's, it's really a very, very difficult job. And I had a bunch of people that were basically teenagers that were there to make the money. But they didn't need the money. So usually about halfway through detasseling, they, they'd be like, this is too hard. I'm out of here. But I was the crew chief and I needed them to stay. And so in the process of telling them they wanted to quit, telling them why I needed them to stay, that it wasn't just for them, it was for me and, and for one another. It changed the dynamic of the team. And that's one of the ways that I learned that making a job and success about you will only get you so far. Mm -hmm. And making it about something that is connected and collected is what really drives things forward and makes things happen. Um, so, yeah. And what I love about that example, Jane, is that Leadership happens anywhere and everywhere. It happens oh. in the cornfields. It happens, you know, at it's a rebel It's not weapon. based on title. It's everything. It's I not mean, based on education. It's mm -hmm. based on the ability to rally people and bring them together. So I also say, um, it's not what you have or haven't done. It's what you can and will do. And what you make and make of what you got and give of what you got. Um, if you come forward and you make and give what you got, people will respond to that. So my next question was, now how do you define success? But I feel like mm. you just answered a lot of that, but can you talk about that a little bit more? I can. Um, well, first of all, I feel really strongly, um, a lot of a lot of women that are successful have worked so hard and have overcome so many barriers that by the time they get to the corner office, they're exhausted. <laughs> they're like, I've done my part and I'll be a sage on a stage, but it's really hard to give back. And so I want us as women to kind of rethink what success is. It's not just reaching the top of the turret. It's throwing the ropes down and throwing the drawbridge down for others to come up, right? It's how much, how many people you can get to ascend because as women, us throwing sticks and stones at the castle isn't going to break through the walls. We need people to help us ascend and help us lift up, including the guys, including the men, many of whom are wonderful and will help us do that if we ask and accept and take that. Like it or not, the people, many of the people that are in positions that we want or have experiences that we want are men. And we have to ask and accept and, and that help. That said, Success um, is how do you reach that 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 way? If you twist yourself into a into someone else's definition of success, you will be crusty and salty. You'll be like twisted into a pretzel that is crusty and salty. Trust me, I've tried it; it doesn't work. So create your own yardstick for success and for worth, and that way, if you know what that is, your yardstick, and you that becomes your true north. That's what happened to me when I became demoted, was demoted in, in a job and decided that I'd take the next job only by reclaiming my measure of success and in, in leading and managing in that way. And and I'm glad you brought that up because, again, another very 
poignant moment in the book when you talked about being demoted and you know you weren't going to take that job you talked to your husband like what does this look like yeah you know but you're like okay I I'm demoted but I'm going to step into this and then what happened Jane um I say I was demoted I I I wasn't demoted I was I had the opportunity to take a different jobs. title Di so here's the thing um, I was a corporate vice president at Microsoft and I wasn't qualified in from technology perspective to take a technology thing. So I, most of the people in my position bounced to other companies that had very senior level titles, et cetera. I'd been in an accident. I was unable to do that. So almost every person that I talked to said, Jane, don't take a demotion. Do not take a different role with a different title. It's you've earned that thing. Don't do it. But in the process, I asked myself, do I want to learn and grow in a new job? Do I, can I make a difference? And can I create a culture that is consistent with my values that enables me to lead in a way that I'm proud of and in a way that has gotten me to this successful in the past? The answer was yes. And in that scenario, the title didn't matter. So I said yes and actually pursued a role that enabled me to create a culture and create a team that was consistent with who and what I was. And when I did that, that's when things took off for me. Mm -hmm. The title was less than what I had. Mm -hmm. So I love that story so much. And to that you led with so much integrity, but that that integrity is deep within your heart. And it's like this is this is like you're at Microsoft, it had a it has a very um stark reputation for the type of um oh, they environment ate their it is right and at, at that time they ate their young yeah what was that they ate their young yeah their exactly young. and you know you built a team that that oh. st still talks to about you to me and they're like she was the, she is the most amazing leader we ever had you know somebody i just saw you know post on one of your instagram or facebook accounts it's like can you come back to microsoft i mean so jane has been an amazing leader over the years and so i want to kind of shift gears a little bit here and i know richard you're here today and i want to honor the man in the house and thank you for being here but a lot of us are here are women and I want to talk, Jane, um, a little bit about what you see as the biggest opportunities for women in the world today. Should we show the video now, or do you you want to talk a little bit and then show the video? Because we I'll have show the video, time. and then I'll okay, respond. Let's, let's just um, let's just take a glimpse at this. So, hold on. I sent this video to Joni recently. Yeah, I'm just a couple her. of days. Ago. It's from Barbie, by the way. Let's talk about the dream gap. What's that? It's the gap that comes between girls and their full potential. You see, starting at age five, girls stop believing they can be presidents, scientists, astronauts, big thinkers, engineers, CEOs, and the list goes on. Why? Because what else are we going to believe? When by age seven, we're more likely to think that boys are smarter than us. That's ridiculous. When we are three times less likely to be given a science-related toy. That's sad. And when our parents are twice as likely to Google, is my son gifted? Then is my daughter gifted? That's not cool. We need to see brilliant women being brilliant and see how they got to where they are to imagine ourselves doing what they do. But we can't do it alone. I'm going to stop it there. I love that so much, and I'm so glad that um, Jane shared that with me. Um, are you still seeing that or not? Yeah. You, still, you are? Okay, let me, sorry, let me I close am. this. I'm going to stop sharing. So Jane, talk to me about that. I loved, I loved it. Go ahead. I think you're still sharing your screen. I don't know. Okay, there we, there we are. Sorry. Ah! My my brain, the COVID brain is not working very well. I have to, I have to admit. Um, 
that clip makes me tear up actually it, yeah. it's why i'm involved in the boys and girls club um that was me and it's really hard to overcome those voices uh, it was me too i mean just yeah. to be clear it was me I think too. it's so important that we get people who think differently in the corner office. And I am not anti-man. In fact, we need men. We need people in the corner office of all kinds of thinking. We need women, people of, of, of diverse backgrounds and colors and everything else in the corner offices making decisions. And we're going backwards on that front. And a lot of it is because um, people, like what I said before, people will wait until they feel they're more or better qualified before they step forward into roles. They will step away when they think they're not qualified, they are not ready, or their imposter syndrome, and they will not claim what they bring to the table. I have a story in my book called Outside In that talks about being an outsider trying to make our way in. And even when you get in, you feel like an outsider because you're coached how to talk, how to sit, how to act, how to engage. And no wonder we've lost our voice when we've been told so long to lower our voice. And I would say that that my response to that is that it, that is exactly why we need and why we should succeed, because we do think differently. We do act differently. We consider problems and solving and interaction and so on, oftentimes from a different perspective, a different experience, a different gender, a different background, whatever that's from. And that is a good thing. And that to claim that and own that, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. And to bring that forward with strength and confidence. And sometimes to be able to do that, you are you feel like you're alone, but that is seldom the case. Even when I was the only woman or one of the only women years ago breaking through the glass ceilings, as the only woman I knew that was pregnant in an executive position, um, there were lots of examples like that. When I opened up, there were other people to support me and there were other people that felt the same way. So the messages we're giving our girls are still that oftentimes today. And what they need to see and what we need to see is people that are succeeding, people that are stretching and growing and, and um, in positions that, of, that make decisions. Um, yeah, and I think that it's so important for all of us to remember with with young people, um, with young women and young men is is to bring them along, is to mentor and take your, you know, the time and your expertise to mentor people along the way. And Jane, you've done an amazing job at that. You mentioned like at one point you had 27 under your yeah, wing. Well, it was crazy, but a couple of thoughts on that. One is sometimes people think they can't mentor because they don't know what they have to give. <laughs> and your experience is your, you have a lot to give. Mm -hmm. I've, I recently was coaching someone putting together their resume for a job and I stopped them and I said, what's going on? You're reluctant to talk about the things that you've done. Yes, you've only, only worked maybe in fast food at Panda Express, but you trained people, you managed customer service, they put you in charge of this, that, and the other thing because you stepped in when the manager didn't. Those are all transferable skills that you need to claim. They didn't have a title and they didn't come with a, a degree, but that's what's gonna differentiate you. So please own that and, and recognize that that is the stepping stones to grow and develop. Everyone has something to give. The other thing I'll tell you is I used to think of mentoring as, you know, like I said, I had to hit a threshold before I could mentor someone. And then I thought it was a gift that I gave to someone. Well, there's someone on this call right now, Julia Pollock, that will tell you, that will say, I used to mentor her and now she's mentoring me in how to launch this book, how to do social media, how to think about things. We had a call this morning. She's like, no, Jane, it doesn't work that way. It works this <laughs> way. Okay, okay. Even this book cover I was about to launch this book and one of my mentor, one of my mentees, we went out and had some drinks. She says, I love your book, but I hate the cover. The next morning at 8 a.m., this cover was in my inbox and it's the cover of my book. So if you think that you have to wait to give this big gift as a mentor, please think of it as an exchange where you're going to receive as much as you give. And then it's not based on title or degree or income or anything else. Please mentor, especially those that are coming up. 
Look at those little girls. Yeah. It's um, one of the things that's really uh, meaningful to me about Rebel 11 is that we've always had women of all ages mm -hmm. join us for our in-person events and on our virtual events. And, you know, when we first started about seven years ago, we would walk into, we would have monthly events here in Seattle and we would have women in their 20s sitting next to women in their 70s. And everybody's like, gosh, this is so unique. This is so different. You don't usually see this. And that is something that is so meaningful because it is a two-way street of all ages. I mean, I'm constantly learning from my young friends, mm -hmm. even those that are five. <laughs> and oh, I sure. just went and visited my, my <laughs> friend who is 92 and a half. And I have to just impart one thing that she said. She goes, I want to live um, the rest of my life with more love and joy. Like mm -hmm. what a gift, like what an yeah. incredible reminder. So we're yeah. constantly learning and where the messages come from don't matter. They're just something to embrace always. So, yeah. and, and you I know, I, I go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. I will um, acknowledge that growing up, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I think of those girls and the opportunity every single person on this call has to influence someone to tell them what they can be what what they might be able to be what to think about is so so important because they can't think of it themselves they've maybe never been exposed to it or worse they've been told what they couldn't be um yeah. i was at the boys and girls club recently we were, and we were making something we had to put your name tag and they said put your title on your name tag and it was like a bunch of third graders and not a single one of the girls had anything to do with a career it was an influencer was an actress. I guess that's a career. Sorry. Um, but it was really interesting. Not one of them had on their their title anything that required um, a, it was a traditional professional thing. Um, what did the boys have? Typical things, right? More typical Engineers. things. Certainly. Yeah, Some of them had doctor. Um, <laughs> one of them had a firefighter. Um, Honestly, not 100% sure because I mostly hung out with the girls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I want to talk a little bit about the impact of your female friendships and community. So kind of stepping more into your personal life and how that's impacted you, not only um, day to day, Jane, but, you know, in your professional career as well. Um, my gal pals, my girlfriends, my team which is transcends women to be sure my community family's my favorite word family's my favorite word it's really important to you i know it's <laughs> it's everything to me and when i say family i don't mean just family by blood i mean my extended family and i was on a call recently with my sister we were on a zoom and she said we're reesburgs we've never met a stranger um <laughs> which is kind of <laughs> how i am um <laughs> Uh, and, be, and and when you think about things, people as a community, and you think about, I've got some very, very close friends, one of my best friends in her mid 70s. Um, and to your point, somewhere in my their early, late 20s and 30s, um, they reflect and lift in a way that I cannot do by myself. And in a way that transcends, um, they're honest in a way that I can't be honest with myself sometimes. And they are able to help me be a better version of myself than maybe I allow myself to think sometimes. And in the process of seeing them and helping lift them, you grow as well. Mm -hmm. And you open the door for all, all boats float, right? Um, Revel 11 is a community of men, Richard, thank you, and women. <laughs> yes who who are committed to not only personal growth and per personal and professional growth, but committed to lifting one another and helping one another open doors, helping one another see and encourage and inspire and enable and all of those things. My favorite saying, and I have, oh, that I have it. Maybe I don't, I do. Almost every day have in my pocket a coin that says together we can do what we can never do alone. And I believe it, absolutely believe it. And so when I forget, I reach into my pocket and I pull out that coin. And when I put it in every morning, I think about 
my community. I think about, and I ask for how else and who else I might be able to um, meet, greet, lift, help, support, receive from as well. We're not in this. And, and, and Jane, that is living a full life. I mean, that is, that is a full life embraced, stepping right into love and, you know, compassion and community. <laughs> and so how, how do you manage that? I mean, how do you manage boundaries in your life? And when you have a beautiful family, your board president of the Boys and Girls Club, um, you have wonderful friends, and how do you take care of you? My husband says the only thing I've I've really failed on my entire life is retirement. It's like you suck at retirement. I'm working just as hard and I'm not getting paid. He's like, really, you <laughs> really, this is not what I had in mind. And doesn't she look happy? <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's um, and I used to kind of brindle at that, like, oh, I'm defensive, but now I realize um there's an expression, and I think of it as a blessing that says, May your purpose and passion be your life's work. And so when my husband says, when are you going to stop working? My answer now is when I stop breathing, because my purpose and my passion is what I devote my life to doing. So I am excited. I am empowered. I love it. There's not all the times that I love. And if you ask Jules and some of the other people on this, they'll say, got to work on your boundaries a little bit more because I love too much. And I say yes, sometimes more than I ought to. Um, but I am better. I take good care of myself. I'm getting better at taking care of myself. I wake up every morning after having a cup of coffee with my husband or making a cup of coffee with my husband. I do my gratitude journal. I have meditation books and I read my meditations. Um, I do yoga with women online, but I know them it's live. And I've been doing that for years. Um, not every day, but often enough. And I do a lot of walks with my good friends, with the dog, et cetera. And those are things that for me ground me. It's different for everyone, but knowing what it is that grounds you and keeps you grounded is so important because when yeah. I do, do that, I spin. I can spin like a top if I don't keep myself grounded. Mm -hmm. um, I did that earlier this week. I was feeling really anxious and I unloaded on, some, on two people that I care about and I had to go back and say, I was wrong. I am so sorry. And it was because I hadn't been grounded and I hadn't done my rituals. I was in a different place and I had got too busy to take care of myself and I didn't take care of them. In fact, I was the opposite. There are, there are three words, two, six words, I guess, um, that I put in the book and, and the words I use is there are words the ego cannot utter. The ego cannot utter the words, I don't know. And I am sorry. Mm -hmm. If you're unable to say, I don't know, that's ego. And you need to, you need to think about that. And if you're unable to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I was wrong. That's also ego. And none of those things serve me. And I, I don't have room for that anymore in my life. That's a door that's shut. Yeah, that's so beautiful. I just, I'm one of the things that, um, one of the reasons why I originally started Rebel 11 and getting women together is that I had lost myself in my career and I was trying to find my true self, my true north, and what that looked like. And I think you've done an amazing job, Jane, at embracing life embracing life fully stepping in a hundred percent and give Jane Jane is the best of friends like if she says she's going to be there she's going to be there I know she did that in her job every day how else do you think that you embrace your best self every day I think I just I think I just answered that I, yeah, I think also you did too. um I've done a lot of jobs that other people judged me on. I mean, I commuted to South America every week when my child was one and a half years old. And I heard all the time, I couldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. How do you do that? I could never do that. That's judgment. I was so judged. And instead of feeling judged and saying, what the heck? I, I absorbed it. And I don't, I try not to do that anymore. But I also recognize there are, 
there are anchors that I have traditions. When I was with my kids, we had dinner together. It even influenced where my son went to high school because he wanted, he was going to go to high school 40 minutes away, which meant we couldn't have dinner together at night. So he didn't go there. He went somewhere else, went to Bellevue High School, public school. When I traveled, I wrote little notes and I put them in the shoes of my boys and in their backpacks. I still do when they come to visit that just said, I love you. You're awesome. You're amazing. Thank you for whatever. And it was those touch points that kept us connected. And I think I did that as much for me as I did for him, making sure you keep those touch points. And that's what keeps me centered. Writing notes to others <clears throat> that say thank you is as much about what I need to do. I need to acknowledge how someone has helped me. I need to acknowledge the good works of others as much as I need to express it to them because that keeps me grounded. Um, what a gift. I mean, there is even a section in the um, um, book about the notes that she would write on her teams, you know, for her team and leave them on their desk. And if you got a Jane thank you note or, you know, a love love note that how excited you, they were and they would post it up on their wall. I mean, that is caring, Jane. But and then they started to do that to other people because right, they were part right. of the culture. So, it, you know, the first thing I did when I get a job is I get my name on whatever the logo is of the brand we're working on. And I send notes when people do a great thing and I keep them in my backpack and I write notes. And sure enough, it doesn't take long before people start writing notes to other people because you give what you got. You get, you give what you've received. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. That energy is definitely going back and forth. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that I didn't ask you today that you would like to share with our community here today? Um, you, I think you called this claiming your worth. Mm -hmm. And I want to just remind the women and then Richard, anyone on this call, that worth isn't earned. It's not, it's not a birth, it's a birthright. It's not something you earn with a promotion, with anything, weight, appearance, anything like that. It is a birthright. And that nothing that someone does or says to you can take away that worth. So claim that, own that, recognize that. It's really important to know that you are worthy. And then you have the skills, whatever skills you have, you have skills, you have strengths to own and to claim and to, and to cherish that is just so important because you will have voices, your own, others, et cetera, that will pull you back and hold you down. And it's only by being centered in knowing that you have worth, that you have skills and capabilities and all of those things that you can share with someone else. That's so important. When I was a child, I had a, a five gallon pickle bucket that I that was mine. It was a small house, lots of kids. I got a pickle bucket. And in that pickle bucket, I stuck all the ribbons and everything else that was like really, I thought was like made me worthy that said I matter. And that pickle bucket got chopped. And with it, I thought was all the things that said I was valuable. And so I spent a lot of time in my life trying to refill my pickle bucket. And it wasn't until I was later in my life that I realized it's not what you put in the bucket, it's what you take out and share. And that each one of us is born with a full pickle bucket. <laughs> oh, I love that. We have and all the pickles we need. Pickle bucket. <laughs> that is just so beautiful, Jane. Um, the book is called worthy and it's all about taking the un in anything out of your life but you're worthy from the cornfields to the corner office at microsoft i'm telling you it's a beautiful book jane is an amazing writer as you heard earlier today when she read a little excerpt and i would um i just think you'll enjoy it so much and jane you inspire me every day to be a better human being. And I just am so grateful that you joined us today on Rebel 11. What a joy. Thank I've been waiting for this you. moment for a long time. I agree. <laughs> and, and can I make a plug? If you do buy the book, please buy it for yourself or someone else. And know that in the doing that, you're actually helping, helping a club kid 
get a scholarship, move the peanut forward. And if you would, if you enjoy it, um, leave a review because it turns out I'm not a celebrity. I don't have a big budget. I'm not a big social media influencer, not even close. Um, so that's how people learn about it because it turns out there's two other books by the same name that got published within a couple months. So please um, uh, yeah. like and support. You'll love it. Anyway. Support the book and the Boys and Girls Club, and, and you will not. You will be so happy you did. I'll just leave it to that.